Make sure you share on your app so people see. People are watching, folks. Hallelujah. And we are out. Good morning. Good morning. In um, Bangkok. Good morning in Bangkok, Thailand right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, and uh, Joe, we can, we, uh, I think the back is cured. We could probably <laughs> turn that back. <laughs> If you don't know, if you, if you hear me say that sometimes, you don't really know what I'm talking about. How I never cured tobacco, or how I never cured tobacco. tobacco. Um, I, used to grow, I grew up working in stick barns, and you had the heaters in the, in the floor, and you climbed up in the tiers, and you hung the sticks with the tobacco hanging on them up and hung them down, and the heat would rise through them. And those barns were hot. So if, if it, we say how I never cured tobacco. And, um, huh? Okay. I'm, I'm good now because I'm up here breathing warmth. Uh, well, good to have y'all. Y'all got right in the middle of our discussion about the heating system. Glad to have y'all tonight. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Uh, your place to be. Glory to God. If you're looking for a church or you don't have one and you just be kind of whatever, we'd love to have you come and visit with us here at Expedition Church, 6302 Walter Wright Road here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. We are 4.3 miles off of the uh, Elm Eugene exit, exit 124 on Interstate 85. We're 4.3 miles. We're three miles north of NC 62. Um, not too awful far from the Random and Road uh, 62 uh, interchange. <coughs> We'd love to have you come visit uh, and be with us. Uh, I guess we're about three or four miles off of um, US 421 uh, headed down to um, Forest Oaks. Come be with us, praise the Lord. I want to remind you of the books we have currently in the bookstore available, 100 Divine Healing Facts by Dr. T.L. Osborne, a uh, great book to have, In Him by Kenneth Hagin, um, tells you who you are in Christ, but it has all the scriptures, 150 scriptures. Now, when I say scriptures, the references, you've got to look them up in your Bible, okay? But it's there, it's a handy reference book. Healing belongs to us. Um, small trade book size here for uh, talking about the subject of divine healing, and uh, it's, it's a good thing to have around. Listen, it never hurts to refresh yourself. I, I remember when I was dealing with my toe issue, I was listening to healing sermons, uh, well, actually, Brother Hagin, all night long, every night, okay? And, um, you know, I don't do that. I don't do that every night, but during that time, that season, I did. Hallelujah. Believer's Authority, the benchmark book uh, from Brother Hagin, that has changed uh, nations, glory to God. And then the name of Jesus, hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful uh, book there. We encourage you to have these in your library. Um, if you want them, uh, let us know. We can, we, have, we can get them into your hands, praise the Lord. Glory to God, hallelujah. Well, glad to have you tonight. So happy that you were able to join us. Go ahead, if you will, once again, and open up to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and um, glory to God. We talked last week, and we're picking up and connecting to that. <clears throat> our words dominate our lives. Hallelujah. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it is impossible. Hallelujah. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And that word please, I, I looked that up, and I, think I talk, said this recently, to come into harmony or agreement with him. Okay, doesn't mean that you're trying to make God happy. Without faith, it's impossible to be in harmony with him, in agreement with him. Amen. Hallelujah. For he, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hallelujah. And so as we kind of started into this, and, um, you know, how sometimes when you're preaching, you kind of go off on rabbit trails, and I believe last Wednesday night I did. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of come back and, and go back into life. May run off another rabbit trail. You say, well, well, you know, what's, you're covering some of the same material again. Do you know? Um, <laughs> I um, we had a class with Brother Hagen. It's called Faith Library. Okay, he'd come in. Uh, he, we had that class three times a week. Okay, uh, in the first half of the year. And we have four block marking periods. So the first two were the first, well, actually it was every other one. Three, three days a week on this one, 
and two days a week in the next one, and three days a week in the third, and two days a week in the fourth. And then the second year students, it flipped like they were opposite of us. So he taught five, he would teach five days, first, second student, okay, on Faith Library. You know what scripture he used every single time? Mark 11, 23 and 24. Every time he walked in, he said, hey, you just, you, you didn't have a weight. You already had your Bible open because you knew he, what he was going to. And he had, he would start out sometimes in the same place. And then by the time he got done, he was somewhere completely different than he was in the previous class, giving you a whole new thing. Or he was telling, he was going down here and going down here and going down here, telling this story. And say, oh, and by the way, he'd go over here and do this and do this. And you'd be way down here somewhere. And he'd come back the next day and then bring them all and close them all back up. And he'd get back up to the original point and go, y'all thought, you, you thought I forgot where I was, didn't you? It was, it was pretty funny to watch him do that. <clears throat> but going over things more than once is, is, is good repetitive uh, things. So our first point is, you know, that we will never rise above the confession of our lips. Okay? What you say, you know, you've heard what you say is what you get, but there's a lot of truth in that statement. Okay? There's power in words. Words are the thermostat of your life. They are the thermostat that, that, that sets, you know, and we just change the thermostat back here as, as we were getting service. And when you come into the building, it's a little chilly, and, you know, what we need, to, you go in there, you set the thermostat. And the heat comes on, or during the summer, the air conditioner comes on and cools it down, whatever we're trying to do. But that thermostat dictates what the temperature is going to be in here. Okay, your tongue is your thermostat of your life. You dictate where you're going to be. You're dictating how you're going to live. Now, some people say, I don't believe that. And that's the problem. You're, you're, you're getting exactly what you say. Because you're saying, I don't believe any of that stuff. And, you know, I never had anything. I ain't never going to get anything. And then you just keep living there. And, well, of course you're not. You can't. Because you are setting your words are setting in force and into operation the world you're going to live in. Now, I always tell people this. If you don't like where you're living now, change what you say. Because if you keep talking about the past, all you're doing is reaching into where you don't like and putting it out into your future so you can walk in it again by your power of your words. Words have authority. How do we know that? The law of Genesis. If you go read the, uh, the book of Genesis in the first three chapters, the Bible says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. He kept saying, and it kept happening. Amen? Okay. And so the scripture says this. It says, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken by the words of thy mouth. A uh, amen? Amen. <clears throat> Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then Romans 8, 9, and 10 says this. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now that, that Greek phrase really can say that Jesus is Lord. Okay? <coughs> and shall believe in your heart, or thy heart, that God is raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Why? For with the mouth, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So our words are vital even in our being born again. Okay? What did the Old Testament scriptures say? Let the weak say, I'm strong. It didn't say, get up for the weak say, I'm decrepit. Hello? It said, the weak say, I'm strong. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, that Following that point, confession proceeds possession. If you don't believe it and you're not saying it, you won't possess it. Now, this is not the power of positive thinking, okay? It's the power of positive believing. Biblical believing, okay? Um, now, I know they've done some things, and, you know, the people have, have you know, like a, um, certain writers have uh, come to places where um, they always, they're always talking about be positive, and, and it's good to be, you know, and I believe in being positive, 
okay? But I believe that the power for the believer is in the Word, speaking what God says about it, okay? What did he say in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8? That this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Amen? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. Now, the word meditate is interesting. It does not mean getting in a weird position and going, um, okay? It means to mutter. The Hebrew word translated meditate in the Old Testament means to mutter. Anybody ever muttered? Now, husbands, sometimes you mutter. You can't, and your wife goes, what? Nothing. Because <laughs> she, she, she says something, and you won't too happy with it, so you walk off muttering, grumbling, okay? How many of you ever hit their thumb with a hammer? And you muttered, okay? Speaking to yourself. You, you ever heard people speak to themselves? They sit around, they think, oh, man, I just don't understand it. They're muttering. Well, here, the Word of God says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. This is why we say there's no such thing as silent prayer. Amen? There's no such thing as an unspoken prayer request. That's just an oxymoron right there by itself. Unspoken request. Okay? Request by the very nature of the word means you're asking. Okay? Unspoken. I, I, I challenge people to try it at McDonald's tonight on the way home. Go through the drive through hold that. Say, I got an unspoken order. Guess what you're going to get? Not a thing. Or something you don't want. Okay? You, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the, a, an order, you know. Okay. They, they'll think, man, that man is crazy. Get out of our drive through Well, I've got an unspoken order. No. no, there's no such thing as an unspoken prayer request. People do it all the time on Facebook. Unspoken request here. Let me ask you something. If I come to Janice and Jerry, they're sitting here on the front row. And I go, I've got to, I want y'all to agree with me in prayer. They say, what is it? It's unspoken. Now, how are they going to agree? How can they agree? If they don't know what it is, I want them to agree about. Because I could be thinking, I, I, uh, I want a million dollars. And they might think, uh, Pastor Ed wants to get healed of something. Without the verbalization of it, we can't come into agreement. Okay? So the words of your mouth have power. So he says here, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate, mutter, therein day and night. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now the Hebrew phrase, have good success, means says, shall deal wisely in the affairs of life. Okay, so he says here, you know, you'll make your way prosperous and you'll deal wisely in the affairs of life if the word of the God stays in your mouth. See, there's a, there's a, there's a part of believing and faith that must be released with words. Amen. I said amen. That, that's, a, that's a hook for you to join in and say amen. amen. Okay. And so, th there's power in those words. And so, we come to this New Testament scripture in Mark, and we, we talked about this, how that, you know, Jesus had gone by the fig tree, went there to happily if he might come upon it, and uh, they had leaves, but he was thought, thinking he was going to get some figs because he was hungry. But when he got there, there were no figs on it for the time the figs were not yet. Well, why did he go to the tree, thinking he would get figs if the time of the figs was not yet? Because they bud leaves when they bud, they bud, they get their figs when they bud their leaves. So that tree lied to Jesus. Can you imagine creation lying to the master? Well, he didn't like it too good. And so he looked at that tree and said, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. They went into Jerusalem. He ran the money changers out of the temple, came back out, went back out. And some, you know, maybe, maybe the next day, as we said, that, that term on, on the, uh, in the morning, uh, phraseology-wise, could have been some other time in the future. But we'll just go with the very next day. 
Okay? All right? And we're not changing the Bible. It's just that, you know, we understand we're tra- we are changing a Eastern book into Western language. So you've got, to, you've got to take into consideration the cultural mindset of what phrases meant. Okay? We're not changing the Bible. But what was the implication with when they said it? And when we, you know, and that's part of translating and not, I mean, interpreting and not translating. You've got to understand what something may mean in order to translate it properly. Now, if I, went, if I go in, into France and preach and say, man, I, that made me happier than a pig in slop. And they try to translate that without understanding the nuance of that. It, people are probably going to look at you like, okay? And so... Um, we, we were talking in Spain with uh, an, an interpreter, and uh, we were saying, you know, so, talking about certain phrases. And, and I said something, and they, and, and, uh, they, they didn't understand what I meant, meant. And I said, oh, they said, well, we would say it this way. And they t- gave me the English phraseology for it, okay? It got the same point across, but it was, it was because you had to understand what was behind it. So uh, when this was written, it could have meant as much as the, the, the very next day, or it could have been a period of time. Now, the reason I think it probably was, was as they were passing by, Peter called to his remembrance. It wasn't like it was a 24-hour and uh, Jesus forgot about the tree. But Peter kind of went, hey, the tree that you cursed, it's withered away. And Jesus said, have faith in God. All right, you know, he didn't even respond to the tree. He said, have the faith of God. Now, again, that's, that you've got multiple interpretations of that phrase. And one of them is have the faith of God. Or the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, and we talked about this last week, how many whosoever's do we have here? Raise your hand. All right. Whosoever shall say. Notice he said say. Unto this mountain. Now, he is not talking about a literal mountain. Let me give you some rules of Bible interpretation. Number one, literal. If he can't take it literally, then it becomes allegorical. Okay? Symbolism. Here, Jesus is not talking about running over, standing in the Himalayas, and putting Mount Everest out in the Pacific Ocean. Okay? It's not a literal example. It's symbolic. Allegorical. That taking a mountain an insurmountable object and putting it into the, be thou cast into the sea. Amen. So he says, be thou, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now he's not talking about putting mountains in the ocean. Because then the people who wanted it back there are going to go back and try to bring it out and put it back where it was. It is symbolic of an insurmountable circumstance. Okay, the, another, another example in the Bible. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Well, number one, trees don't have hands. So this is symbolic. It's not literal. There are symbolic things in the Bible. We first attempt to translate it literally. If you can't, then you go to the symbolic. And then try to understand what the message behind that is. Okay? We, and, and you get people who do that all the time. And we have to be careful because you could take something and make it literal that was not intended to be literal. Amen. And really hurt people with their faith or manipulate them. All right. So um, who shall ever say? Again, we're talking about the, the mouth. Unto this mountain, be thou removed. To be. Now, so, now, Jesus is telling believers, um, that there are going to be insurmountable circumstances you face. But there's a way to deal with it. Amen. You can't osmosis it. You can't have a silent faith. Amen. And we'll show you, uh, we'll show you in a little while that you can have faith and still not have the answer. And I'm going to show it to you. Brother Bill, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? It's in the book of Acts. 
saying, have you heard Paul preach? And he perceived. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, Brother Bill. <laughs> He's trying to keep up with me. <laughs> All right. All right. <clears throat> I'm messing on Brother Bill here. All right. So, <clears throat> say, insurmountable circumstance. The first thing Jesus said you got to do is speak to it. Say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe, what? That those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Now I want you to notice something, and this is Brett Dad Hagee used to teach us all the time and point this out. The Lord spoke to him and said, you're going to have to do three times as much teaching on saying as you do on believing. Because it's in this verse three times, the word say in some form is in that three times. Believing is in there one time. A lot of people are not speaking their faith. Well, it's very personal to me. Okay. But you've got to get it out of there into action. See, faith without works or at corresponding actions, James says. Now, just, just a side note here. James and Paul were not a disag in disagreement about works. They take, because people took one English word and failed to understand, again, the implication behind how it was being used when they translated it and used an English word to translate out of the Greek how it was being used. Paul talks about works, but he's talking about doing the works of the law. James, on the other hand, He's not talking, he's not even referring to the law here in James 2.20 when he says, what thou know, obey man, that faith without works is dead. What's he talking about? Corresponding action. And if you read the passage there, you know, somebody comes to you and hungry and, you, and, and naked and you say, be filled and clothed and go your way and you don't do anything for him. What have you done? And that's what he, that's the, the premise upon which he makes this statement that faith without corresponding action is dead. Now, <clears throat> let's say this. You can make this. You can put this in your notes. I hope you're bringing notes. You need to. You need to be. A, look, I know everybody's got cell phones now. Well, take notes on your cell phone. Okay. All right. You know, it doesn't hurt to bring the Bible to church, <laughs> but you know, use your cell phone. Take notes, because here's a note. Okay. The number one corresponding action to faith is your words. What you say. What you speak. Now, there's other things. I mean, you know, in, in financial matters, but obeying God in the in realm of tithing and giving is a, a corresponding action. Okay? There are times that there are people are told to get up and walk. Corresponding action. But the number one way, and we see this over and over and over again in the Bible, is to say it. Anybody understand why God changed Abram's name? Because he was, he, he was Abram, God says, you know, thou shalt no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For the father of many nations I have made thee. When he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, the word Abraham meant father of many nations. So he, had to, he went around and started telling everybody, my name is now Abraham at 99 years old. Hello? You got to be thinking. People, the, the, you know, at the, back in those days, they would meet at the city gate, you know, the elders and stuff. And talk. Can you imagine him showing up there going, all right, guys, got a name change here. I'm now the father of many nations. And the, probably the first thing they're thinking is, he's gone senile. All right? The father of many. So what happens? Don't call me Abram anymore. Call me Abraham. And so every time he heard his name being called, and every time he said his name, he was declaring and hearing declared, I'm the father of many nations. God put that, God told him to do that. Okay? God told him to do that on purpose. We have things in the Old Testament with that there. Um, um, the, the, uh, the wife of one of, the, of uh, uh, Levi's sons, or... 
that was killed, not, is it Levi? Um, which was it the sons of Levi that were killed at the, ta- the temple, the tabernacle gate? Yeah. And her, when her child was born, she named it Ichabod. The glory of the Lord departed. Over and over again, names were given that spoke certain things. So God changed Abram's name to Abraham, the father of many nations. And we're not just making something up and making a good, feel-good kind of thing here. This is a biblical principle that speaking is part of faith release and in key and important part, okay, of, of releasing your faith. And so Joshua, again, we're back into Joshua, chapter 1. He says, uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt m- mutter. Who do you, whose voice do you believe more than anybody else's on this planet? Your own. You believe you more than anybody. Isn't that right? I mean, we got husbands and wives in here, and we know this from being married. You believe you more than you believe your wife or your husband. Or you put on the show and act like you don't for your wife or husband. Because I know some of who, who some of you are married to. The mouth of source over there. How would you get roped into it? <laughs> I, I just I made that name up for her one day. And she is mouthy. I'm not gonna ask Dennis. I don't want to have, to have to do marriage counseling before we leave tonight. <laughs> and that's daddy's girl, and he loves her, and she's mouthy, and she loves it. She loves being spunky. Okay. <clears throat> but you believe you more than anybody else. You believe your own what you hear you saying more than anybody else. That's why you're to mutter the word. That's why you are to speak it, so you hear yourself speaking it. Amen. See, I could come up to you all day long and go, Janice, you're a winner. Janice, you're a winner. Janice, you're a winner. But if Janice falls out of here and says, I'm a loser, what's going to have more effect in her life? Me telling her she's a winner or her saying she's a loser? Okay. Or let's take it to the next level. The devil comes sitting on your shoulder. And saying, you're a loser. You're not healed. Speaking those words into your ear. You've got to speak. You've got to declare. No, sir, Mr. Devil, I want to tell you, the Word of God says in 1 Peter 2, 24, that by his stripes I was healed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Are you, are you here with me? And the Word of God says that I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Glory to God. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even my faith. I'm not a loser. I'm a winner, glory to God. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath, glory to God. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out, praise God. I'm blessed in everything I set my hand to. You've got to say it because the devil's going to sit on your ear. You ain't had nothing. You ain't had nothing. Listen, this is, I mean, there are parents that should be beat with a tobacco stick. You're just like your daddy. He's a drunk, and you're going to be a drunk. And the kid grows up and be a drunk. What do you think? Why? That's all you ever said. That's all, you know, people say things over their children. Oh, my. Speak faith over your kids. Speak life over your children. Speak blessing over them. Hallelujah. Let words of encouragement and life flow out. Hello. Why? Now, some people told me I, I don't sing bad. Not great, but don't, don't sing bad. I don't believe it. You know why? All I ever heard growing up was, boy, you couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Hello. That's all I ever heard. So I even, and I even bought into it. You know, when I worship God, I don't make a joyful noise. I make a glad racket. Okay. Hallelujah. And uh, <clears throat> I still can't perceive myself as singing anywhere, like even on pitch or note, you know, on key. 
Because all I ever heard was you can't carry a tune in a bucket. Words have power. Words have authority. And so God told Joshua, as he's taking over from Moses, and there's a transition of power, that the book, this book of the law shall not depart out of it. Why? Well, because God's word is full of faith. God's word is full of blessing. God's word is full of upliftingness. <coughs> Hallelujah. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but there you go. It will lift you up. It will raise you up. God's word. So don't let it get out of your mouth. Speak it. Mutter it to yourself day and night. Amen? And he says here, here's the reason. That as you speak it to yourself, you, now this is going to be King Jimmy, that thou mayest observe to do. Okay? According to all that's written therein. In other words, by speaking it, you will begin to act on it. That's what he's saying here. And in doing so, you're going to make your way prosperous and you'll deal wisely in the affairs of life. <coughs> so God says what you say is vital. It's a vital connection to what you believe. Now, um, in the charismatic word of faith circles, starting into the 60s, we began to talk a lot about confession, you know, and we, we have books are printed on our daily confession, and they're all good, but I think some of those titles should have been our daily meditation or our daily muttering because we were saying, you know, people were saying stuff, and they didn't believe it. But see, that's why the book's supposed to stay in your mouth. So that as you continue to speak it and continue to speak it, then you'll begin to observe to do. You'll begin to act on it. Because you believe, you believe your words, you believe your own voice more than anybody else's. Amen. Anybody get that? All right, don't get out and run out of here. Don't go, don't, don't go get no... Uh, Religious zealot rocks and throw them at me. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're to keep it in our mouth and say it. So he said, first say it, mutter it over and over again. Then you will begin to observe. <clears throat> I think it's hard sometimes for people to come into service and you know, hear, you know, don't ever make a negative confession again. Just say, I believe I receive it. I got it. Don't ever say anything different as long as you live. And, uh, and you don't believe it yet. you got to keep saying it and meditating on it until you believe it. And then it moves from meditation, the same words, the same declaration will change once it drops into your heart that you actually, you know what? I am the head, not the tail. I am a winner. Then it goes from a meditation of what those words are to a releasing of faith. So they look like the same animal, but they're not. They act the same, walk the same, but in the end, one is you're building faith. The other is you're releasing faith. Well, I don't, I don't want to have to go through all that. See, you don't want to do the process. Now, you can't be spiritually lazy. That's why he said it shall not depart and meditate day and night. This is a, this is a regiment. You ever been on a regiment with medicine? Now, some of you got more faith or more confidence in the doctor than you do in the Bible. Now, God says go on a regiment of speaking his word. I don't believe that. But you'll go right over here to the doctor so-and-so, and he'll get out his little pad with his name up there, MD. And then he's got a big blank space, and then the place for his signature with his name down there, you know, printed out so you because it ain't nobody on the planet can read his signature. Okay? And he'll write, you know, twice, you know, he uses all these little letters, you know, two dime data, and you, you, you're like, what does all that mean? You know? He'll say, I'm going to put you on this antibiotic. 
You need to take two, two pills for the first day, and then you're on, for the next 14 days, take one a day. What people do, they line up at the sink every night, get them a glass of water, take, well, the doctor said take it, and it would get rid of the infection. Hell, it just put you on a regimen, and you follow that regimen, you know, and you didn't take it the first day, and instantly, whatever, you know, if you had an ear infection, it was gone. May not even felt better. Then the next day, then it started feeling a little bit better, and started getting, you know, you, and, and you kept going. Why can't we get on a regiment with the things of God? And the Word of God, and obeying God, and God says, don't let the book get out of your mouth, meditate therein day and night. Yeah. Why? Because in the end, you're going to observe to do it. Yeah. And when you observe to do it, you're going to make your way prosperous, and you're going to deal wisely in the affairs of life. Yeah. Amen? So, Jesus said, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And then he went on to the next verse and said that, Therefore I say unto you, I like this, because he didn't let it get limited, super limited by people who would try to rob people of any kind of faith. What, say, uh, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, now we said this before, we'll say it again, and we'll say it till Jesus comes back. The Greek word pray, A-I-T-E-O, is the same Greek word translated in James 4, 6, ask. Again, what is this? Verbal. Let's say it this way. What several things you desire when you ask? Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Again, speaking. Speaking. You're going to have to say things. And you're going to say things contrary to circumstances. Else you wouldn't need the faith in the first place. If all the circumstances were great, you wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't give us an example of an insurmountable circumstance. And using words, if you weren't going to encounter that. So when you encounter it, you've got to start speaking it. Like I said, you know, uh, this week, Sunday, or, or last week, when I had to deal with my toe, I was speaking to my foot. I was speaking to that toe. You know? That, that confession Brother Hagen has in that, that the um, Healing Belongs to Us tape series. It was a tape series when it came out. They put it on CD, then they put it on MP3, and now they may even have it on digital download. <coughs> Probably do. You know, he said, say, Body, the Word of God says, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Body, you line up with the Word of God. Body, you are healed in Jesus' name. I did that every night for four months. And then when that doctor looked at me and said, Mr. Taylor, I'm going to call that toe healed. I said, Doc, that's what I've been doing for four months. I've been speaking to my toe. <coughs> they couldn't believe it happened. I didn't need for them to believe. It won't their toe. It was my toe. Hello? It was my toe that needed to be healed, not theirs. They were doing all they knew to do, but what they knew to do wasn't going to fix what I had. It helped keep infection out while I believed God for it to heal. Okay? They, what they were doing, you know, I was comfortable with that. And then, like I said Sunday, don't ever feel like you've done something uh, uh, out of faith or you're some type of non-stalwart uh, charismatic if you go to a doctor. I've heard pastor. I know, I know of a pastor who died because he said and taught that going to a doctor is a slap in the face of Jesus. Hello? Well, I mean, that's just stupidity. I would never counsel anybody along that line. If you come to me and tell me, Pastor, I don't have, I don't have faith for this, then go to the doctor. And we'll believe that God, and, and listen, we'll, we'll get to some level of faith. We'll believe that the doctor will have the answer and be able to give you and do things for you to help you and uh, 
<coughs> and prolong or, or heal, you know, get you where you can be, believe, use your faith and get healed. Hello? That would never. It's, 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 it's not. You're not a greater Christian because you got healed without going to the doctor. And you're not a lesser one because you went. Hello? It's, it, it's where are you? What's the stage of your development? Are you here? You know, the Bible likens, I'm, I'm, I'm not rambling. I'm just following the, the, the thread that the Spirit's putting out there. Now, I saw Tim come in tonight. Do you know that little Tim's got the same number of muscles in his body that I have? He didn't have any different number. He's just a little guy, though. And I go, you know, and I say, let's go to the gym, Tim. And I pop down there and I, I bench 250. Yeah. Super pastor, you know. All right, Tim, get in there. They take off the bar and it crushes his chest. Well, it's not that he's a lesser human. He's not developed to that point. So what do you do? You let him go to maybe 25. He might not even be able to do the 45-pound bar. I don't know. Okay, then you go lesser. And you find out where he can. And you build from there and build up. And faith is the same way. You build your faith where you are. And it doesn't make you a lesser Christian because you haven't developed up here. And what we get is we get a lot of cocky, arrogant Christians who have developed their faith out there to a certain point, and then they condemn those who aren't where they are. That's not, that's not number one, that's not Jesus. Hello? That's not Jesus. So if you can't confess that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus and, I, and I'm not going to the doctor, no, no knife from the doctor is going to touch my body. Then let's find out what you can believe. And let's go there and start speaking that. I believe when I go to the doctor, you know, he has the answers and, uh, and, and we're going to, and it's going to lead to me being free from this in Jesus name. But, but build it up. I said, build it up. I remember when I first went in the gym, I, um, you know, years ago, um, I graduated from high school. We, we didn't really lift in high school back in our day. We did some, but not really. We had machines and you could, we just played around. Listen, I, I sat on the back of a, of a, uh, uh, of a tractor on a harvester picking up 225 pound racks of tobacco all day long and putting them on the trailer. That was my weight lifting until we filled the barn. We had a winch. It took too long to hook the winch up and use it um, to keep up. So I just grabbed it, turned around, and put it on the trailer, slid it back. Every one of them weighed 225 pounds. That's all day long. And it, I didn't even think about it. Just kept doing it all day long. Now, I remember when I went, went to the gym, though, lifting weights is different because it's m certain muscles have to be developed to maintain the right balance and that kind of thing, all right, especially with free weights. I remember when I first started lifting, I could, about 135 was all I could bench. You know, in less than a year, I was benching 360 in a pyramid workout. I maxed at 360. Starting out, I'd warm up at 185. Six reps. Then I go to 225, six reps. Then I go to 275, six reps. Then I'd go to 315, six reps. Then I'd go to uh, uh, like 350, six reps. And then I'd go 360 and do whatever I could do. And then I would come back down to each one of those weights and go back down to 185 in a year. But I didn't start there. I was squatting 415 times and deadlifting 415 times. So my power... They, I think back then you used to call it like a power lift. My combination was 1,160 pounds. So 400 squat, 400 uh, deadlift, and 360 bench. I was big. In the right places. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But I didn't get there overnight. I mean, I got big arms. I got, my, my, my chest got big. I mean, I was, I was, I was big. And weighed less than I do now. <laughs> Significantly. I'm like, 
how does that work? <laughs> That's just not fair. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> but it took time to build that. Now, when I walked in there, can you get intimidated? You walk in there, and you got the meatheads over there, you know. And, and when you walk in, they're already in the front of the mirror. Okay. Yeah. Getting, getting, yeah. That could be intimidating. And then they're down there, you know, they're pumping it up and down like this, and you're, you're like, I got my 135. <laughs> Help. <laughs> okay. <coughs> but I didn't let it bother me. I just kept working. Okay. I kept working. Don't get intimidated. And don't let some, quote, well-meaning believer come up to you. <coughs> And tell you about how they didn't have to use didn't have to use any doctors. I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad they were able to believe that. And that gives us something to aspire to to get to that point. But if you're not there, don't not do what you need to do to get well to, so you can get to that point later. Amen. It's important. It's important we understand those things. We are a faith church. We believe in the Word of God. We believe healing belongs to us. We believe in speaking it. But, if, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. When, I, when my toe was in the situation I was in, I needed to get to a doctor and get, get somewhere so I could get my faith in operation because it was in trouble. I mean, they were going to cut it off the next day. It wasn't like I had six months to get, you know, to, to cut, you know, get my faith working. I had to have, I, if I had stayed home, it could have gone into my foot and had my whole leg amputated. And that was their concern, was it getting into the bone, the, the, the gangrenous. That's the word he used. I didn't like that word. That, to, that toe's gangrenous. I knew enough of that word to know that wasn't good. Okay? And so... Um, you know, and of course, I, like I said, the second doctor came in, the podiatrist. That was, I called the other, the first one, the infectious disease doctor, Mr. Hacky Wacky. Because all he wanted to do was cut my toe off. Even after it started getting better, he said, well, you, you know, that's, it is getting better, but you're probably still going to have to get it cut off at the first knuckle. I'm thinking, no, I ain't, Doc. I'm keeping my toe. I, but when that second doctor came, I said, Doc, he, got, he just got in the room. I don't care what I got to do. I'll do whatever you say, but I'm keeping my toe. He said, he, he said, the other doctor said he wanted to cut it off. He said, well, I don't think we're there yet. Yes, he did. He, he told me later he didn't believe I was going to keep my toe. Okay? I looked, I said, I know how to believe God. I'll do what you say on, on this end, but I know how to believe God. And then I have my toe, the whole thing. I don't have part of a toe. I have the whole toe. Okay? But it took, it took months of, of, of feeding and meditating and speaking, and you, the doctor involved in it too. I didn't discount that. Because, listen, you say, well, he's just the doctor did it. He told me at the end, I don't know what you did, but what you did worked. He said, because people don't keep a toe in that situation. And I got that out of the mouth of two different doctors and four nurses. None of them believed I was going to keep my toe. So it wasn't their great doctoring skills. Mm -hmm. They were just trying to help. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nobody helped. My toe was healed by faith. So don't go, I can't go to a doctor because the charismatics are going to think I'm not, I'm not believing God. Mm -hmm. they, you know, don't, don't listen to them. Don't bring them into your circle. Have people in your circle who will speak faith with you, who, who can agree with you. Amen. I remember John Osteen. I mean, y'all heard, heard of Joel Osteen. Now, John Osteen I, I, was his dad, and I loved John Osteen. Yeah, yeah. He called himself God's little Baptist. <laughs> okay? Although he spoke in tongues and was, was spirit filled, always speaking at the full gospel businessmen's meetings. You know, he was God's little Baptist. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lakewood Church was Lakewood Baptist Church. 
They never, I don't think they ever back then officially changed the name. He said, but we were in church one day. A tornado came by, blew the word Baptist off. We, left it as, we took it as a sign for God and left it off. It became Lakewood Church. <laughs> that's, that's one of his stories. But you know, he, he was talking about one time. He said, you know, I, I'll, I'll take an aspirin for a headache. He said, Father, I'll take this aspirin in Jesus' name to alleviate the symptoms, but I believe you're the healer in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So there's no condemnation. Amen. If you're not there, fine, no condemnation. Start building. Do what you need to do to get there. Amen. You don't want to die in the process of trying to get there because you're not going to have a die. No knife touched my body. That's my confession. And where did you get that confession in the first place? Usually some wild-eyed, car-looking, charismatic comes up to you. Trust in me, trust in me, and hypnotize you. Well, I'm going to tell you, brother, right now, I believe God, and I, I, I say over you, no knife will touch your body in Jesus' name. Well, are they, are they God? Is that a word from God? I mean, are you speaking that God gave you that word for me? Now, even at that, even at that. The Bible said that the children of Israel did not enter in because the word spoken was not mixed with faith. So somebody can say something to you, and if you can't mix faith with it, it's not going to work. Amen. Can I get an amen from the resounding amen corner back there? <laughs> and, and, and the sidekick. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Belinda's, Belinda's voice is not the resounding deep amen one, Okay. They've got like a nice balance. Okay. Hallelujah. It has to be mixed with faith. So, <clears throat> one, you more mature Christians, be careful how you speak to people. Speak faith. Encourage their faith. But find out where they are and see if you can help them there. Amen. This brings us to second, the next point. You must believe the words you speak in the end. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith, as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Amen? Hallelujah. We got into numbers last week. and I preached the same message, it just it came out different this week. Who was here last week? Wasn't it different than last week? Different than last week. Because we're hitting different points. We're hitting different points. See, that's what happens sometimes. You, you, you may be coming at some of the same things, but we're hitting different things in there. Okay? What happened to the children of Israel? They went into the land, spied it out, came back, brought back, you know, 10 brought back an evil report, 2 brought back a good report. Caleb sealed the people, so let us go up at once, for we are well able to take them. And the other 10 spies said, no, we be not able. They, the, the giants are in there. And they eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all that. And, the, and this is what they said. Numbers chapter 30, 13, verse 30 through 32. And um, he said the people are stronger than we. No, wait a second. What did God tell them to go do? He said go spy out the land. He did not say go out there and find out if you can take it or not. Because that's what they were supposed to go do anyway. He said, go spy the land out. They came back with the grapes on the, on the thing, the land that flowed. They, they said this in verse 30. I think they come back and they say they searched the land. Da, 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 back up. Back, back verse 30. Well, I throw it on Brother Bill. He's got to work quick. It wouldn't do me any good to give him notes ahead of time. Would it? Probably not. Um, hit 29. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? Okay. All right. I'm going to have to back way on up. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. I'm going to go all the way back um, to verse 17. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get ye up this way south and go into the mountain and see the land that it is, the people that dwelleth there, and whether they be uh, strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is they dwell in, whether it's good or bad, what the cities they be, they dwell in, whether it's tents or strongholds, and what the land is, whether it's fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin to unto Rehob, and came unto Hamath, and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Anam and Seshal and Tamal and the children of Anak were. And he the Hebron was built seven years before Ze Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eschol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes and bare it um, between two upon a staff. And they brought some of the pomegranates and other figs. And the place of the brook Eschol, well, they called it Eschol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned searching the land after 40 days. And they went in and came to Aaron and the congregation and um, the children of Israel into the wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh and brought back the word unto them and said unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they said, We came into the, la into the land where thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Now remember, God said he's going to bring them into the land. They've already had that promise. Nevertheless, now wait a second, we don't need your narrative, okay? The people of the land be strong in the city, and their cities are walled, very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. <coughs> and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel. Through the land through which they were gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now, later, when the ch 40 years later, when they finally go in, um, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. They ask, what took y'all so long? Because, see, they had heard about all the miracles. They were shaking in their boots about this crowd that was headed their way because their God had just delivered them out of Egypt. With all these miracles and all these plagues that came on Egypt. And then they, 40 years later, they're like, what took you guys so long? Hello? They had lived 40 years in fear that any moment Israel could show up and come in. And they didn't get to go in because of that. Now, the big key here is we were in our own sight, and so we were in theirs. You give power to the kingdom of darkness by being unbelieving. You give power to it. Hello? Amen? They were, they were not supposed to bring up an evil report. You could tell, you could, okay, yeah, look, there's strong people there. They got walled cities. But Caleb had the right report. Okay, no big deal. We, <laughs> we just got delivered from Egypt, guys. We, got, we did the Red Sea thing, remember? Walled over on dry ground, God swallowed up a hole in that army. What, what's this? A few giants in the land? We're well able. We're well able. Let's go right now. Go get the land. God had promised it to them. <coughs> but they spoke the wrong thing. That's why David said, put a watch over my mouth. See, he, was, he, he knew the story. He knew their very words is what kept them in the wilderness for 40 years. A whole nation. Until everyone above the age of 20 except Caleb and Joshua had passed. Everybody else died in the wilderness. Everybody 20 and under got to go in. And I'll bet you they had it rehearsed every day. Don't you dare say you can't. <laughs> Don't you dare say that you can't go in. Don't you dare say. Hello? They went in strong. 
And then I think over se the next seven years, they, they just went to every city and took it. Even got to Jericho, it's supposed to be the best, most best walls. Uh, archaeologically, they said that six chariots could ride side by side on the walls of Jericho. Now, when they found and did the dig and found Jericho, they found that the walls were flat with the level of the foot of the city. You, you've seen the movies where they're going in and taking it and the walls are falling over and big boulders are rolling. God just went, and they just ran right in. Hello? They weren't big boulders falling everywhere and crushing people and all this stuff. <laughs> But six chariots, so they, they got to Jericho, and that's, that's, not a, that's a pretty imposing sight. And then God says, now march around it every day, and don't say a word. Don't you say, why? He knew his people. He knew some believing mouth off. Yeah, they'd be going, oh, my God, that's a big wall. Oh, Jehovah, what are we going to do? That's one whopping wall. I mean, look up there. There's chariots riding up there all over the. Oh, he, don't you say a word. For six days, they walk around there and don't say a word. Then they get up next on the seventh day, and God says, Now, you're going to march seven times around the wall. And the first six times, you're going to do like you did the last six days. You ain't going to say nothing. Because all it would take is bonehead on wall on, on circle three, start talking unbelief and get the whole crowd in on it, and they're defeated. But on the seventh, you'll shout with a shout, and you'll take the city. And that's what they did, and that's what happened. And they possessed it. God knew he had to shut their mouth to get them into the answer. Amen? Hallelujah. And so that was rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed over and over and over again. All right. Some of y'all remember Frosty Morn commer uh, commercials? It's Frosty Morn hot dogs and bologna. Now, we didn't call it bologna growing up. We called it bologna. How many called it bologna? We always called it bologna. It's, it's spelled bologna, you know. I think the old Oscar Mayer commercial used to say, my baloney has a first name. They, <laughs> they, didn't say, they didn't say it right either. Hallelujah. So let's be aware of speaking faith, of meditating on the word, declaring what God says about circumstances. Amen. Don't be condemned. Like in this case of healing, you need to go to a doctor. Now, there are people who teach you can't borrow money. You're 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 uh, you're a slave to the 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 the, um, the one who the lender. Are you any less a slave to the lender if you're bu buying a house with a mortgage than you are to the rent the apartment complex and you're paying them every month and you're in a year long contract? Hello. People just do some dumb stuff. They say some stuff, you know. Um, we 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 we're doing something here. I mean, it's, it's, it's not what God's saying. It's, you know, don't put yourself in a place where you can't pay back. But, you know, they've taken those scriptures, and, th and they did it. Well, yeah. And what I usually find out is people doing that are in ministry. Hello. And they can say that and then go take big offerings. you got to be careful. Now, you got some big-name ministries that refuse to borrow money. Brother Hagen borrowed money. Yeah. Yeah, he borrowed money. Yes, he did. Was he any less of a faith person than some of these other preachers that say you don't borrow money? Hmm. I didn't think so. Okay. Now, I have a mortgage on my house. Unless you're going to believe God, I mean, you know, for 100000 200000 300000 400000 whatever, and have that show up. And I, I don't know where you're going to live until then. I mean, mom and dad may not want you in the house at 60. <laughs> Just say it. Okay? Um, if you go get an apartment, you're, 
That's not even wise money finances if you, if you uh, can help it. We, we found out what happens with apartment living, and if you're in it, I understand that you know, some people are there, and that's all they could do, but they got you because if you, do, if you, they don't let you go to month to month after a year. You are, you're in another year contract, and then you can find your house somewhere in the middle of that. You've got to pay out the, the, the apartment. So if it's $1,000 a month, you've got to pay out $6,000 just to leave. When they, and they turn right around and re-rent it that six months to somebody new. They're, they're double dipping over the time. Okay? At least when you're buying something, you're, you're investing, and you're, you're gaining equity in the home. Amen. Now, we, we were in that business park all them years. We didn't borrow money to be in the business park. But over the time we were at that business park, we almost spent a million dollars at least over 25 years. Almost. But we didn't borrow. <laughs> Hello? Now we've come out here, we borrowed money. Our mortgage payment is a fifth of what our lease was. Fifth. Fifth. And we borrowed money. Oh, you borrowed money. You're a, I was more of a slave to the business part guy than I am to the bank over here. A whole lot more. And if we had, if we had walked out in the middle of the lease, I'd be, uh, we would have been, it was four grand a month. So if we walked out of the lease, it would be $4,000 a month we would have had to pay out. And usually they were five-year leases. The shortest they would sign with us was three because we pitched a fit. They wouldn't, do, they, wouldn't they didn't want, you know, month to month or anything like that. Can you imagine being, you know, two and a half years into a lease and go, we found a building. Mm -hmm. Now we got to pay 48, 48, that's 96,000. And another half a year is, um, you know, 24, um, that's 120,000 just to walk away. Hello? Well, that makes sense. Don't let people put you in condemnation about stuff. Make sure you're, you're, you're walking in the faith level that you can walk in and don't let people use stuff, okay? Don't let their conviction become a weight in your life. If it's their conviction and they're living it, praise God, live it out, pal. And if it works for you, glory to God. But don't condemn those who aren't walking in your conviction or your word from the Lord. Because the word that God gave you may not be the word he gave somebody else. He knows where his people are. He knows what faith level they're at. He knows what he's trying to bring them up to. He may be trying to bring them all to the same place where we don't have to borrow money. Hello? But don't condemn the people who ain't where you are. Or don't have the same access to. You've got to give to the higher anointing to get blessed, and I'm the higher anointing. You know what that is? It's witchcraft because it's, manipul it's manipulation. I just sometimes get on a roll. 
I go, I go on the meddling now. Yeah. My question was, was the guy who was at the back of the church sitting on the back row who mops floor at Walnut, mops floors at Walnut Mart at night, how much money got put in his pocket? He didn't have the he didn't have the imagery. He didn't have the name. He didn't have the status. And he wasn't the higher anointing. Now that's the best we got to stop in the church. And we can't have in the church. The Bible does say to take care of the laborer. Those that labor in word, word and deed. They're worthy of double honor. Don't muzzle the oxen that tread without the corn. I understand it. So that's the other side of it. You don't go from one ditch to the other. But you don't manipulate the people into giving everything away to you so they're going to get this return. Hello? See? And, and it moves. It, it's, it works just like Amway works. Okay, I did say it. You get the pie in the sky results by buying in, and all you're doing is you're getting them in your downline up to get to your upline, and you get you rich. You're making you rich. You've got to be careful about that kind of stuff. God said, watch out, for, told Brother Hagin, watch out for the gold, the glory, and the girls. The gold's the money. Okay? Learn to speak faith where you are. Now, we're always going to want to preach the highest. Believe God to get healed. Well, I'm not getting there. Keep speaking. Keep meditating. Keep working. Go see the doctor. Get some relief. Get some help. While you work on building that faith. While you work on growing. While you work on developing. You keep working it. You don't quit working it because you went to the doctor. Okay. I'm going to get some relief and I'm going to keep working this. And I'm going to get, you know, I've borrowed money before to get relief. I remember, oh, my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting long-winded again. <laughs> Y'all weren't here for the days of getting into the second 90-minute tape. Brother Bill. Yeah. yeah. Well, y'all were too. <laughs> there was a day that we didn't have a service until we used up the first 90-minute cassette for recording and put in the second and got into it. Then we had us a humdinger. <coughs> Am I right about it? Yeah. We, um, we, and we, would, we didn't go, oh, my God, it was long service. Yeah, we got into the second. Why? But God was talking tonight. And there's some of you thinking, oh, Lord, don't let it happen again. Oh. I mean, my goal was to be like Paul, was long in preaching. They fell out the window, had to go down, take him up dead, and raise him from the dead, and then finish out preaching the rest of the night. Had a dead raising service right there in the middle of the sermon. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where was I going before that? Anybody remember? <coughs> Yeah, I was, I was about to make one more point. Wish we could back it up and play. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to speak faith. We're going to speak the word. We're not going to let other people control us. But we're going to keep working it. We're going to keep working it. We're going to keep working it. Amen. We're going to keep working. It was some along that lines of keep working it while you, until you get there. Amen. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I know us. You see my little Jeep out there? Now, we bought that in 20, um, we bought it in 2016. It was a 2016. Because of what the church had gone through, and we come out of the building, we had just come out of the building at the business park. Church was in debt up to above your eyeballs. Because we had bought, we had used credit cards, because we had to keep paying that lease. Uh, personally, if we if the church closed down, I I personally was responsible for the lease. In there, we're not I'm, nobody's responsible for this building. Corporation is. If, if church is not going out, but if this church were to go under today, the the uh, Expedition Church of the Triad would be responsible for it, not any person, not even the officers. Okay. Um, but in the business part, I 
was doing business as Faith and Victory Church. I was personally responsible. When I signed that five, those five-year leases, I was responsible for all that money. Hello. And we came out of that business park in 2016. I believe it was the, uh, January the 10th of 2016. We left because we begged him, let us stay till after Christmas. We got this big outreach we're doing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, we, and, and the guy, they, found, they beat on the guy. He, did, he wanted us out of there before Christmas. He just wanted us out of there. He didn't like us. He just did not like us. He, he, he had bought the park, and he didn't like me. I'm a likable guy. But I guess I make de demons upset. So we come out, and our cars were getting old. Okay? And they were, they were getting in bad shape. And we needed a new vehicle. And um, we... Um, and, our, I mean, because of all this stuff, and our, our, our credit just looked like in the toilet, okay? Because, I mean, we, you know, um, we had credit cards that were still maxed out that were in my name. I had gotten to keep the church going. And I made some bad decisions. I'm not going to lie to you. I made some bad decisions in there, trying to keep the church up and running. And um, we went to the bank to borrow the money to try to get the car. And we got it. And we drive around. We drove away. And we're, we're just like in shock. They loaned us money. <laughs> they shouldn't have loaned us money. And the Lord spoke to me as we drove off in that car. He said, this is the beginning of the turnaround. Hallelujah. I thought. <laughs> I turned to Jay and I said, the Lord just spoke to me. He said, this is the beginning of the turnaround. Borrowing money was the beginning of a turnaround for debt. It didn't make sense. The natural, it didn't make sense. We had to have another car. And it did something. I don't know. You know, look where we are now. That's only, you know, that's coming up on seven years ago, a seven year cycle. We've gone from there to debt free in our own building. Cars paid off, by the way. Hallelujah. I own the car. It's debt-free. There's nothing on that car. There's nothing on any of my cars. All my cars. You know, I got one I need to get rid of. It's just sitting in, sitting in the driveway paying insurance and uh, uh, taxes. <coughs> he said that's the beginning of the turnaround. And it didn't look like it. I'm driving the car. I didn't. I mean, 2017 gets here. 2018 gets here. End of 2018, the word starts coming. We start doing things. I mean, all of a sudden... Or 29, uh, 2018 and 20. I, I'm losing track now. But he said that was the beginning. And here we are coming at six and a half, working on seven years later, and look where we are. You know, God does work in cycles of seven. That's, that, that's, that, that's not just making it up. We see it in the Bible over and over again. Seven years of harvest, seven years of famine. Different, different things happen in seven year cycles. Throughout that. And I'm not going to get into numerology and get all kind of weirded out with it. But for us, this has been a seven-year cycle. And look where we are. The beginning of the turnaround. And I'm looking going, we just added more money to the debt pile. How can that be the beginning of the turnaround? Well, he worked a miracle just so we could get a car because we needed a vehicle. Hello? I mean, the, the vehicle we got rid of, I forgot what it was. Oh, it was the... Um, I forgot what car we got rid of. It was running on its last leg. And here all of a sudden, here we come. And we go, and boom, 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 boom. And now we're in our own building, getting ready to go into something even bigger. Stuff's happening. He gave us that word. And I told Jamie, he said, this is the beginning of the turnaround. And we see nothing but turnaround take place since then. So you take a hold of what God's saying to you. Through his word, see, we're staying in the word, and then what he says to you, and run with it. And don't take what God said to somebody else and try to run with it. Unless he speaks it to you. All right, praise God. Let's receive the offering. <coughs> I'm not trying to be long-winded, honestly, people. But um, I'm trying to remember which caravan it was. Um, I really am. 
I, I don't remember which one we traded in. It may have been, oh, it was the light blue. No, I sold it. I didn't even, I didn't trade it in. I sold it to a, another person who used to go to the church. Okay? Uh, after we got the car. We didn't, even get, we didn't even get used for a down payment. We didn't have to use a down payment. And then we sold that. Yep, it was the light blue one. All right, you need an offering envelope? Some are still out there. Hallelujah. All right. You're giving, go ahead and give. Father, in Jesus' name, we speak faith over the people as they tithe and give. Thank you, heaven's windows are open unto them, and you pour out blessings. They don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, Brother Joe, for anybody in, in, in house. And then, guys, I'm sorry. We went, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not. I, tr I try to be sensitive at the time and not get, keep us long, but if I'm in that kind of flow, I can't just stop. And I'm not going to. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to come back next week and try to go an hour and 20 minutes. I'm not going to try to do that. I'm not going to just, you know, oh, well, we did that last week. got to do it this week. But if that's where the, the, the anointing is flowing, that's where I'm going to go. Okay? It could be 30 minutes next week, and I'm going to quit. <laughs> okay? We just want to stay with the Holy Ghost. All right. Let's, we love all of you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Be with us next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Until then, remember, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you next time here. Expedition Church of the Triad. Good night.